All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's give it uh, two more minutes before we begin. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's three minutes past five, so we can go ahead and make a start. Now, I would like to welcome each one of you today to, to listen in to the presentation of the Barima Morum Passage. We have three presenters today that will present in their findings. Uh, without further ado, I forgot, let me introduce myself. My name is Marie Fraser. I'm a marine biologist and uh, I'm a part of the Guyana Marine Conservation Society as well as the Ministry of Natural Resources. Now, I know all of you have been hearing a lot of talks about the Barima Mora Passage. Now, today's your opportunity to listen in and to hear more about uh, what the Barima Mora Passage is and some of the findings that we did from our studies. So let me give you a little insight before I introduce the presenters. Now, the Bruno Moore Passage is a special protected area located in the northern part of Region 1, near the Venezuela border. It is approximately five kilometers north of the town of the regional capital of Mabaruma and adjacent to the Morawana settlement at the intersection of the mouth of the Barima and Arco River. This area contains Guyana's largest and most intact mangrove ecosystem, with the three mangrove species being present, that is the red, black, and white mangrove. These species are found in the surrounding freshwater swamps and tidal wetland along, along the rivers, tidal creek, and estuarine areas. It is a rich biodiversity watershed and blue economy asset makes it worthy of being a world heritage site. The Waro populated area is biologically diverse with species such as the Iber scarlet, the scarlet Ibers, the macaws, the jaguars, parrots, otters, and manatees, some of which are ICUN and CITES listed species. The Brewport Moor Passage is value around 3.4 billion per annum since it provides ecosystem services such as carbon sequestration, coastal protection, fishery sustainability, and provision for raw materials. But let me not tell you more about the Barima Moor Passage. I know my presenters, they have a handful of information to share with you this evening. So just a little friendly reminder to kindly mute your mics. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. After the end of the three presenters, we'll have a question and a discussion answer. We'll also be using our reaction button, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, I would like to say that before we welcome the presenters, um, use your reaction button to give a little hand clap. I know we're not here in person, <laughs> but um, we can make use of those reaction buttons. 
So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Matthew Howlett, who will be conduct, um, sharing his findings on the mammals and ground bird study. Now, Dr. Ma Hallett is an assistant research professor in the Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation at the University of Florida, specializing in monitoring of medium and large mammal using camera trap. He has 10 years of experience working in the Rupununi region of Guyana and has published several fantastic papers on the impacts of hunting of game species, the presence of rare species, and the population density of large carnivores. So I'd like, like you all to use your reaction button there at the bottom to welcome Dr. Matt Hallett. So let me see them. <laughs> Great. So all over to you, Doc. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, everyone, for having me. I'm looking forward to sharing our results. Um, this survey was my first time in Region 1. I've been working in Rupanui for a long time. Um, and so seeing a, a new part of Guyana was really exciting. And um, our research results show that this part of Guyana is very special. So um, I will get right to it. Wrong screen. Okay. Are you seeing Marie? Are you seeing the um the slides? Yes, I can. Okay, great. All right. So um Again, I'm Dr. Matt Hallett from University of Florida. It's my pleasure to share the results of our research findings on the uh, medium and large mammals and ground birds of the Brema Mora Passage. So um, our plan before setting foot on the ground in Brema Mora Passage was to set 30 camera traps uh, along the, the Brema and Kaituma rivers set two to three kilometers apart um, over the course of about three months from, uh, excuse me, yeah, three months from February to May 2021, um, we were able to accomplish that uh, and accumulated over 3,000 total nights uh, or days, uh, depending on which way you like to count them, um, of survey effort and produced over 40,000 individual photographs of wildlife of this region. Um, as I said, this is my first time in Region 1, so flying in, uh, flying over the region, uh, coming into Mabaruma, things look pretty straightforward. You could see the Brima and the Kaituma River, um, forest below, which I've grown accustomed to from coming in and out of the Rukununi. Uh, stepping into boats from Mabaruma um, made things look uh, fairly easy. Uh, the, the engines were much larger in Region 1, so we were traveling much faster. It even seemed like work would be very efficient. Then when we began to turn off of the rivers, we found that uh, things were gonna be a little more challenging, finding some dry land that would be inhabited by terrestrial species. The farther we went up and up, uh, the, uh, the terrain of region one proved even more challenging. And then even more, of course, uh, when we stepped out of the boats and began walking around, attempting to find places to set cameras, um, I'm sure you're recognizing a pattern by now that uh, this is ru very rugged, uh, beautiful, but rugged terrain uh, that presented a number of new challenges for our team. Uh, in this picture here in the red shirt, you see Mr. Fernando Lai, um, who has been working with me for uh, all the 10 years that I've been working in the Rupununi. He's my oldest friend in Guyana um, and is the leader of our team, our research team in the Rupununi. He was able to come up to region one. He was all, that was also his first time seeing this part of Guyana. Um, and he was also experiencing some new adventures uh, with the mud and the mangroves um, and some of the unique uh, challenges that the terrain presented. Um, while we were setting cameras, he and I were discussing in the evenings, uh, wondering what we'd be seeing on these cameras amongst the mud and the mangrove roots. Um, but Amazingly, in those over 40,000 photos, there were uh, over 4,000 independent records of animals. Um, as you can see, the photos were dominated by a few of the relatively small species, red rum to Guti, 
um, common opossum, also known as a yaori, spiny rat, uh, bush deer, lowland paca, which uh, is everyone's favorite, the lava, and white lip peccary, the large bush hog. Um, but this is just merely the number of photographs when we look at uh, another measure uh, that represents how often or, or the, the proportion of cameras where each species was detected, uh, we see a much more even spread. And we see that the camera traps in the Brimamora Passage documented a total of 64 species, which included 28 mammals, 36 birds, and one reptile. And that group of 64 also included 14 species of conservation concern. Um, and so while we weren't sure what we were going to be fine as we were walking around, we were amazed to see uh, that the Bremamora Passage is home to a, a near full complement of tropical forest species. Um, and we were, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm still trying to figure out how some of these species are making a home in between the mangroves. Uh, and in the mud in the Bremamora Passage. So some of the species that were included here, I'll share some of the photos. Of course, Guyana's national animal. The jaguar was photographed on a number of occasions at different sites, um, making a home in Bremamora. This, this was one species that we were expecting um, to see here because we had seen uh, over the years uh, the photo evidence of jaguars preying on uh, marine turtles at Shell Beach. And so since uh, the Bremamora Pass is just sort of behind the dunes at Shell Beach, we were expecting that jaguars would be walking through this area um, every now and then. And that was certainly the case. But we actually saw five out of Guyana's six wild cats on the camera. So uh, the puma was present, uh, also known as a deer tiger across Guyana. This one surprised us a little bit because pumas tend to uh, not like water as much, of, as, much as their other uh, wildcat relatives in Guyana. They prefer to stay dry. In the Rupununi, we see them more up in mountains and in dry lands, whereas jaguars spend more time in the wetlands where they're uh, much more home and, and much stronger swimmers. But pumas are in the Bremamora Passage as well. And so are a number of the small cats, including the ocelot, uh, which was the most common cat on the camera traps in the Bremamora Passage, um, and also the most common cat uh, probably in all of our camera trap research in Guyana. The margay, which is a semi-arboreal cat. Uh, here's a close-up of the margay because this camera trap photo isn't particularly great. Um, uh, they're a semi-arboreal cat. Uh, and this shows you that the Bremamora Passage is home to a number of uh, mature trees in their forested area because the margays are excellent climbers and they spend most of their time in the treetops hunting uh, or, excuse me, um, arboreal rats and opossums. And Guyana's smallest cat, the Oncilla, sometimes called the baby tiger, um, no, not much bigger than a house cat. Um, we did see the Oncilla here in the Bremamora Passage, which is very interesting because our photos of Oncillas across Guyana has been somewhat limited. Um, with all the rivers and creeks in the Bremamora area, you would expect these guys, the water dog, uh, the most critically endangered species and the most endangered mammal in all of South America uh, does make it home and make its home in the Bremamora Passage. And we caught groups of giant river otters on several occasions and also saw them in person during our time uh, conducting the camera trap surveys. Uh, another cousin of the giant river otter, uh, the greater grison. So this is a, a weasel species. Um, which we know per, most often from the savannas, the Rupununi savannas, um, and not so often in forested areas. And this was one species where we were very surprised to see it in the Bremamora area because um, we know it as sort of a, a dry land, more upland, um, arid savanna, avoiding wetland areas um, species. But here it was, and we photographed it on multiple occasions. So it was no fluke that um, the greater grison is at home in the Bremamora area. Um, one of the more common species on camera traps was the crab-eating raccoon. And this was one species that we knew we were gonna see on camera traps because we saw its tracks all over the place, in the mud, all over the Bremamora Passage as we were setting cameras. Um, uh, crab-eating raccoons, like their cousins in North America, uh, are scavengers, they're omnivores, and they like to wash their food and they wash their hands. And so they're very often associated with water. Um, 
they're eating crabs as their name denotes, but they eat a wide variety of things, uh, but they have this peculiar habit of wanting to stay clean. Uh, so they're constantly washing their hands before and after they eat and washing their food. And so they often stick close to water and in such a, a swampy uh, area like the Brimamora Passage, we were uh, not surprised to see these guys popping up on cameras. Another water loving species is the Tyra. Um, these guys look like, look sort of like a dog, um, but they are also in the weasel family. So with otters uh, and grison, um, Tyras are semi-arboreal, they climb trees. Um, they also are very good swimmers. They have webbed toes. Um, they do a little bit of everything. They're omnivores as well. And they were a bit relatively common in the Brimamora Passage. The largest species that we saw on our camera traps was the red brocket deer, uh, also known as bush deer across Guyana. Um, these were also the most common ungulate, which surprised us as well for a place where uh, when we were walking around setting camera traps and sinking in uh, up to our knees or higher in mud, you wouldn't expect to see a large deer that goes over 100 pounds, but here they are. Um, the local team knew that bush deer were around and the camera traps verified that. Uh, we also saw white lip peccaries in fairly large groups. So there are two, are two bush deer, excuse me, bush hogs in Guyana. White lip peccaries are the larger of the two. Um, they roam around in very large herds, sometimes of over 200 animals. Um, we saw some both on camera traps and a uh, sign on the ground when we were setting the cameras, um, indications that there are uh, healthy populations of this white lip peccary. Um, we also saw indications in the market in Mabaruma that there are health, healthy populations of white lip peccary um, because they were the most common wild meat that we observed in the market at the time um, and heard from hunters that this was sort of the most desired species and camera traps showed that this was also the case. Um, the smaller of the two peccaries that you find in Guyana, the collared peccary, often called abuya, um, was also present in Brimamore Passage, although um, less common. These guys tend to prefer upland habitats. They don't swim or wallow in the mud as much as uh, white lip peccaries. They also, when white lip peccaries are around, they tend to be a little less common because they're in direct competition for the same food source. So the larger and more common white lips will sort of outcompete these smaller guys, um, but they are present and they are around showing that um, this uh, terrestrial habitat is fairly intact. Um, everyone's favorite across Guyana, uh, my favorite as well, the lowland paca, also called laba, um, was fairly common in the Brimamore Passage. We expected that this would be the case because they're also a water-loving species. They make their own dens. Uh, they're very good swimmers. They also have webbed toes. Uh, they, they're very accustomed to plunging into the water to escape predators uh, and are very adept swimmers. So um, they're well adapted for making their home in sort of a, a swampy, uh, seasonally flooded environment like you find in the Brimamora area. As I said, the most common species on all of the camera traps, uh, which is also uh, the trend across Guyana in the Rupununi, uh, in region seven and region eight and region four and region 10, everywhere that we've worked, Red Rump Taguti are the most common species uh, on camera traps, uh, which is a good sign uh, because these are very important species for dispersing the seeds of large trees. Um, they're one of the few that have teeth and jaws strong enough uh, to crack the seeds of the very large trees, um, those that are also desirable for timber in Guyana. Um, and it's agoutis that are dispersing these seeds because they collect seeds, they eat some, they bury others to eat later. They forget where some of the seeds that they buried are, and then those trees actually grow up, those seeds grow up into the next generation of large trees. Um, so they play an important role in all forested ecosystem, and, uh, and that's the same in the Brimamore Passage area. One of the most interesting findings in all of these camera traps, and the ones that I definitely did not expect, was to see the giant anteater in the Brimamore Passage. Uh, Working all over Guyana, this species continues to baffle me. I don't know uh, why it is where it is or why it does what it does or why it looks like what it looks like. I have no idea, but they seem to be everywhere on top of the highest mountains, in the driest savannas, in the swampiest wetlands, now in the mangroves. 
Um, giant anteaters seem to be everywhere. And the answer is probably because when you eat ants and termites, your food is everywhere. They'd probably be in Georgetown too if they weren't bothered by noise and people. So um, giant anteaters were also present. We, they were photographed on a couple of different locations. And this was one that really surprised me. Um, their smaller cousin, the Tamandua, was also present in the Remoir Passage. Um, again, these guys are primarily arboreal. So uh, their presence shows an indication that there are uh, mature trees uh, for these guys to climb. They come down to the ground to mostly to walk in between trees. They're also preying on ants and termites, um, but those nests that are high up in the treetops. Um, moving along here, the Yowri. Uh, when I do presentations in the Rupununi, these are always a favorite because they're particularly smelly. So it always gives everyone a laugh when they see a picture of a Yowri. Um, these were one of the most common species on the camera traps. They also are very well adapted to, well, they're very well adapted to live almost anywhere. They're very common in all around Georgetown, all around the coast, um, because they'll readily eat, they'll go in your garbage can, they'll eat almost anything and everything from insects to fruits and vegetables to frogs to dead animal flesh to anything in between. So you would expect them to be almost anywhere, and they were. Um, we also observed a number of monkeys during the trip. Um, we saw squirrel monkeys, we saw howler monkeys, now it's been a little while so I'm forgetting, um, wedge-capped capuchin monkeys, uh, also called jack monkeys across Guyana, were the only um, monkey that we caught on the camera traps, um, but we did observe a number of others, again showing that there aren't just mangroves in the Brimamore Passage, there are large trees and sort of more intact terrestrial habitats that support uh, monkeys and other species. And uh, Brian will be talking to you about uh, the birds that were observed by he and Leon, but uh, camera traps also catch a number of large ground birds. Uh, among the most common were the great tinamou. This is also an IUCN uh, threatened species, um, uh, often called mom in Guyana. They're uh, like bush chicken, right? They're uh, a sort of a large chicken shaped bird. Great tinamou is the largest of I think there are six tinamou, Brian will check me on this one. I think there are six, maybe seven tinamou species in Guyana. Great tinamou are the largest and uh, by some degree, the rarest. Black curacao, also called pawis, was fairly common on camera traps. Even though this species is uh, very com fairly or very common across Guyana, they are also an IUCN threatened species because their populations are plummeting elsewhere because they're very desirable uh, for food. Uh, and last but not least on the camera traps, another IUCN listed species, a threatened species, uh, one that I certainly did not expect to see on the cameras here is the marbled wood quail. Um, this is another ground bird typically associated with dry environments and mountains. I shared these photos with Brian and he was very surprised to see. Uh, and we, we photographed the marble wood quail on several occasions in the Bremamora Passage. So uh, another IUCN listed species, uh, an important bird species and, a, and a indicator that there's not only mangroves and swamps in the Bremamora Passage, but this also wonderful sort of mix of upland and lowland habitats, forests and mangroves and transitional environments. And it's these sort of mixing and transitional areas that are often the most important for biodiversity. Uh, and so I think that's what the camera traps are really bearing out. Um, of course, while we were walking around, we observed lots of amazing birds. Uh, we even saw some fish uh, and not just in the market in Mabaruma. Uh, and I've shared that information with Brian and Mark respectively, and they're going to share their information with you. But we also saw a few reptiles along our way, um, which I thought I'd add here because uh, there was nobody else doing reptile surveys. Uh, so we, we saw at least two species of turtles. The yellow-footed tortoise is another IUCN listed species. They're a threatened species across their range. Um, and they are a species that's targeted both for food and for up to a few years ago, the wildlife trade in Guyana, uh, which is now limited. And so they're an important species to note and know are around. Uh, the labaria is always important to know when it's around because you have to watch where you're stepping. We did see uh, at least one labaria during our time and a number of lizards. This is the brown tree runner, sometimes called the Jesus lizard in Guyana because it's one of those that's able to run across the water tops. Uh, so overall, 
Um, the camera traps and the large mammal uh, surveys documented a relatively high number of mammal and bird species, uh, especially relative to other mangrove and coastal habitats. A number of the species that we saw are usually associated with tropical forests. Um, and so that shows that the Brema Moore Passage is not just important because of the services that the mangroves provide, but because it provides this uh, mixing mosaic of different habitat types with uh, upland and lowland forests, swamps, palm swamps, mangroves, and so on. Uh, in my opinion, the overall diversity certainly warrants the special protected area status that um, the Brema Mora Passage desires. Uh, and I would say that there are a few areas that, that warrant further research. Um, one of the species that was noticeably absent from our survey was the lowland tapir. We know that that's a species that's targeted for hunting throughout Guyana. Um, and if they are uh, naturally rare in this habitat, be, uh, in the Brimamora area because of the habitat type, uh, the impact of the wild meat market and hunting in and around Mabaruma area warrants further research just for understanding and future management. Um, we also, as part of collecting the camera traps, um, there were uh, researchers from Hydromet that went out and took water quality measurements. Um, some of the data that was coming from there uh, raises some concern about the impact of runoff from Port Kaituma. Um, we were seeing that the water uh, in the Kaituma River specifically was quite acidic. Um, and so further research there, I believe, is needed. And then also uh, the, the depth and breadth of fresh and saltwater mixing in the Brima Mora passage area, certainly with the offshore activity going on with Guyana right now. Salt water comes far into the Brimamora passage area, but even uh, goes even farther beyond the areas where you see salt water on the surface. And so understand better understanding of that mixing and how far salt water reaches in and would bring things offshore inland to the Brimamora passage would be very useful. Um, thank you so much to our team. We had a wonderful uh, team from Guyana Marine Conservation Society, um, some very, very talented young researchers. I had a great time working with them. A number of them have since traveled to the Rupununi um, and visited with our teams there and overlapped. And I hope that we can continue to work together uh, to do cross training, to share our experiences uh, and, um, and to continue learning and, and hopefully um, uh, recognizing this very special place in the Brema Mora Passage. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that are in the chat um, or that will be offered after. And I hope that you enjoyed this summary of our findings. Thank you, Dr. Matt Terhalet, for that interesting presentation. Um, it's quite interesting to know that we have several red listed, ICUN red listed species in the Brema Mora Passage hence make it as a potential, you know, our proposed heritage site. Uh, nevertheless, let's welcome our second presenter, which is uh, Mr. Mark Rum. Um, he will be presenting on the fishery studies. Mark Rum is a lecturer in the Department of Biology at the University of Guyana. His research interests include marine and coastal ecology, freshwater ecology, freshwater management, blue carbon, climate change mitigation, sea level rises, coastal wetland, and governance of marine resources. He also worked as an independent consultant conducting biodiversity assessments on several projects in Guyana. Mark was a team leader of the fishery studies in the Barima Mora Passage. So let's once again use your reaction um, to give Mark a warm hands of welcome. Thank you, Maria. Over to you, Mark. Great. Um, I'm having some internet issues, so if I'm coming over unclear, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to rejoin. All right. All right. Um, yes, so the fishery study actually complements what was done um, by Matt and, and Brian, um, looking at the biodiversity in the Barima Mora Passage. And this is a very important region, not just the Barima Moro Passage, but region one is very important for mangroves because it is one of the regions in Guyana that has the most intact mangrove. But sadly, it's also one of the region that has been 
most impacted over the last five years, losing an estimated of 1,419 hectares of mangroves. This is compared to our other regions along the coast, which is from regions two to six, which have seen an increase of 5,000 hectares of mangroves. So it shows the travesty um, of the mangrove loss in, in the region, but not only the, the loss of mangroves, but also the loss of habitats and related biodiversity. Um, as we recognize this, the mangroves are very important for crabs, for fishes, for other uh, life forms that exist in the region. And um, it's a major, it provides food source to many of the persons that actually rely on crabs and fishes. And this is why it's particularly important. It's also important in the mangrove in this um, region is also important because it's estimated to be about $3.4 billion of ecosystem services contributing to the people of region one annually. And therefore they are highly dependent on the mangroves to maintain or to sustain their livelihoods. Um, fish is also an important source and protein source for the people of this region, utilizing both uh, freshwater and estuarine fishes as they are landing sites as well in this region. And hence this, re this study was actually done to investigate the composition of fishes that exist in the um, Barry Memorial Passage area and, and, and basically to set a baseline of the freshwater fishes for us for the region. So this is basically uh, the Barima Mora passage area. And these are some of our fishing points that we have covered. We sampled a total of 19 sites in, the, um, in this area. And we utilized a combination of gear types to sample this area. Now recognizing that mangroves are very difficult ecosystems to work with, it's particularly challenging for us to utilize some of the traditional fishing methods that we would use for other habitats. However, regardless of those challenges, we worked around those, uh, utilizing mainly the gill nets to capture the larger fishes and the drag nets to capture the smaller fishes. We had more gill net sites than the um, drag net sites because the habitats were unsuitable for sampling. And also the region is the, um, the river is actually tidal, which made it extremely challenging for us to set nets and to collect fishes, some parts. Nonetheless, um, the team, we conquered more work around most of the challenges and we collected a total of 329 species, sorry, 329 individual from 32 species of fishes. And most of these fishes were actually collected from the siluriform family, which is a family that uh, our catfish, catfishes are, are, are part of, representing a larger part of the composition in the region. This was actually followed by our caraciforms, um, which also includes many of the commercial species that we consume, and our persiforms, which are um, which includes uh, the, some of the fishes that we also consume. Across the different sites that we've sampled, we realized that some of the sites had varying diversity and abundance. In, um, in all of the sites, we found that the site farthest to the Atlantic actually had more species than those that are inland, with the exception of site 17. But the other sites would include site one, two, and three. These are sites basically closer or more towards the um, Northern Atlantic Ocean. And in this area is of uh, obviously the estuarine environment, and there's a mixture of salt and fresh water in this area, supporting a higher diversity and abundance of fishes in this area. In terms of the abundance, we found that our, uh, what we locally call here Tui Tui, um, which is a, or Amphiaris rubus which is a fish that actually utilizes the estuarine environment was most abundant species. And this was followed by our basha or the Plagia science squamosis. This is a very important um, commercial species for the people in the region. Followed by our um, Parimata, what we call um, Atakali in, in Guyana, also consumed by the local, um, were the three most abundant species. 
And the least abundant species, which we only recorded about one individual each, were um, lebris microbes, which are about our fishes, um, our coffum, um, just, just to name a few. When we did a, a closer analysis, we found that over 53% uh, of the species that we collected were actually commercial species. And these are very important for the people in the region, either utilizing this for subsistence or this is being sold at the local markets and landing sites. With a total of 47 um, percentage of non-commercial species, which have very, very little to no use in the region. These are some of the non-commercial species that we have recorded. Um, with some local names, we have here high water, yeah, um, Emery, uh, this is the, um, we have a e re in the middle here. This is the Katkali. Also have the um, Black Piranha. And we have the Flunder here. So most of these are non-commercial because they are not consumed um, by the locals and they are not utilized in any other um, trade or any other activities um, in the region. For the commercial species, uh, this is just showing you some of the species that we've recorded. Uh, we have the Huri here, very important and very um, species which is only restricted to this area is the Marcot in the second image. Uh, we have uh, the Snook here. We also have uh, Basha and there were several species of catfishes represented by this image here. Um, we only recorded one, one individual of the market and um, this on our informal discussions with the fishers in the region. We recognize that the market is basically harder to find now than, we, than it was several years ago. So there's a challenge basically in finding these species and you're no longer finding them in the habitats that they were several years ago. So this is indicating that they are pressure on this particular species and this species, because it's only restricted to this part of Guyana, um, because of its connection to the Orinoco or the Venezuelan region, um, the pressures on this species is actually um, show, causing the species to migrate uh, and hence the longer time that they're taking to find this particular species. In terms of the IUCN status of the species that we've recorded. Most of the species are not endangered or threatened in any way, but we found that one of the species was vulnerable. And this is the coffum that we locally call it, or the um, Atlantic tarpon. And this is a very important commercial species here in Guyana and in the Gulf of Mexico, um, all the way to Florida. Uh, very important fish species, and they're actually because of the vulnerability of this species, in some countries, it actually impose a ban on harvesting this particular species. Um, so this particular species was one that inhabits the estuarine environment, very common um, along the coast of Guyana. However, um, it is very vulnerable. So uh, it is one of, it's one of the species that definitely you should consider in or proposal or of the special protected area or our heritage site consideration for the region. Um, so in terms of our findings, um, we found that overall the area supported many, many vulnerable species uh, as well as commercial species, which are directly linked to the livelihoods of the people in this area. As I said, there were some challenges in terms of sampling um, the species, especially just the juveniles. So we will still require some additional research, but it could also support um, the records that already exist for the region from the Shell Beach protected area, which recorded about 59 species in 2011. Um, but still we need some more studies on the juvenile and obviously because we are restricted to the Burima Moor Passage area, um, our focus was a bit narrow and not the other parts of the river. Um, there is need for legal protection of the habitats, which many of these species use. For example, our snook, um, is very, they are very 
reliant on mangroves for spawning and um, also other commercial species such as nebris microbes or or waterfish also utilize the mangroves for um, for spawning and laying their eggs. So definitely, uh, we need to protect the existing mangroves in the region. And as I, I explained a bit earlier, the mangroves are seeing a loss in the mangrove region, and this likely can be linked to the increased number of persons in the region. Um, there are actually reports from the IMO local office. Um, of over 30,000 30, persons coming over from the neighboring countries. And obviously they require space for um, their homes for, um, and because of this, obviously they would have to clean fair mangroves, not just for this, but also for agriculture and planting and so forth. So there's definitely, um, considering our findings, there's definitely scope to support the creation of the special protected area. Um, for the Barima Moor Passage, which actually complements the findings from other study, um, as we can see from the vulnerable species that it supports. But not only the vulnerable species, but also the many commercial species, which the local communities are reliant on for their survival. In terms of um, recommendation, we definitely recommend continuous um, monitoring of the fish population in the region. And this is essential, especially because of the habitat changes that we're seeing, um, more specifically the habitat loss that we're seeing in the region, and also um, the other water quality changes that we're seeing from the Atlantic. Um, we, for example, we've had reports last year of mass fish die off in the region um, because of the fresh water being, more fresh water being released into the Atlantic than normal. Um, creating an unsuitable condition for some species. We recommend uh, well, continuous water quality monitoring in the region, and this is very important, um, as Matt have alluded to, because of the changes with the estuarine environment. Um, it's a very stutic region, and you have constant changes. We also recommend the study in the aquatic um, invertebrates, but more specifically to target the crabs in the region. Um, we recognize that there is a solid waste issue in, um, in the region, especially along the Burima River where we work and spend most of the time. Uh, so definitely this needs to be addressed because it can have further implications um, of the solid waste and the, um, the pollutants actually break down and this can actually lead to marine and other forms of pollution. And we also recommend a study on microbial contamination in the region because we recognize that a lot of the um, latrines, for example, were inundated by water, especially during the wet season where it's very high. So there are um, possible avenues for microbial contamination. I would like to um, thank the persons who made this uh, trip possible, uh, TriStar for funding this project, the support from the Diana Marine Conservation Society, especially um, Annette has been very, very um, generous and, su and supportive in this study. I'd also like to thank the team, which comprised of um, Michael from EMC, Maria from Natural Resources, Daniele from Fisheries, um, Fisheries Department at the Ministry of Agriculture, Kanika Goodman, which is a biology student at the University of Guyana, um, Devon, a local from the region, and also all of the Locals were very supportive of this study, um, sharing their knowledge with us all of the time, especially if we needed any guidance or, you know, where sites are, are, are guiding us to sites that we can sample. Uh, with that, thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that presentation on the fisheries. Uh, just a general reminder to our participants, please, if you have any questions, leave them in the chat and we'll discuss them after the end of uh, the presentations. Now, did you know that uh, mangroves are a habitat for biodiversity? As we learn from Dr. Matt and Mr. Mark Ram's presentation, there's so many numerous species living above and beyond, beyond and below the mangrove ecosystems, uh, which relies 
for food and shelter. Mangroves are important nurseries for fishes, crustaceans, and they support a huge variety of insects, mussels, etc. They also provide habitat for many uh, mammals as well. But looking at it, looking at our next presentation, um, Dr. Brian O'Shea will be talking about the bird study. So I'm very interested to learn more about that. So Dr. Brian O'Shea is a museum-based ornithologist, which basically means the study of birds. Um, they study the distribution and the ecology of birds of the Guyana's shield for more than 20 years. He has participated in numerous biodiversity survey expedition in Guyana and Suriname and led training courses for university students, young environmental professionals and indigenous conservationists. Brian's current interest includes the development of research tourism and conservation for endangered bird species in the Rupununi region of Guyana. Brian was part of the ornithology survey team in the Barima Mora Passage, which documented a wealth of bird species, including two that was previously unrecorded in Guyana. So let's use our reaction button to welcome Dr. O'Shea to listen to his findings on the bird survey. Over to you, Dr. O'Shea. Okay, thank you, Maria. And thank you for everybody for uh, tuning in up to this point. Hope you all can hear me. Here yes, we, go. we can hear you. Good, good, good. Okay, let's get into this then. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the bird survey that we did in the Barima Mora Passage back in October of last year. Um, want to, uh, especially acknowledge my collaborator in this, Leon Moore, who was instrumental in, um, you know, keeping everybody's morale up during the uh, sometimes trying conditions that we were surveying under. Uh, and he was a really great um, uh, partner in all of this and also took a lot of really outstanding photos with some of which you'll see uh, coming up here. Um, before I start, I would also like to just acknowledge uh, NRG Holdings for funding the survey and Annette and GMCS for uh, spearheading the movement to uh, to preserve this area because it is a really uh, special place. Uh, Shanika was our on the ground representative there. She came out with us every day. Um, I want to especially acknowledge our trainees from Imbotero, uh, Ryan, Olivia, and Leslin, uh, pictured there on the right uh, during one of our many, many breaks from the rain. Uh, here they are studying field guides and taking notes and uh, doing our best to learn about the birds when we can't actually be out watching the birds. Uh, that happened quite a bit. Uh, also want a, a special shout out to Smokey. Smokey was a really outstanding uh, guide. Uh, he really knows, you know, I was told that he knew every little nook and cranny, every little creek, every, every gap between the trees of the entire Barima Mora Passage. And that was really true. Uh, it was really amazing to see how he could navigate through this region and just, you know, without any obvious landmarks, know exactly where everything is. Uh, really, really, uh, really great guy to be with. Also the communities of Imbatero, Smith Creek and Morawana. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time in all three of them and uh, we uh, greatly appreciate their uh, hospitality during our time there. Okay, so um, the Brima Mora Passage, uh, we've learned quite a bit about it up to now. Uh, it is a really uh, vast, extensive forest. Uh, like a lot of places in Guyana, it is you know a, a largely forested area, only really sparsely populated, uh, and and fairly relatively undisturbed. Um, but the Brimore Passage is a is a very resource rich area, and it, the resources sustain Mabaruma and all of the surrounding communities. And as such, the resources are uh, extremely valuable to everybody who lives there, and also. Uh, uh, people throughout Guyana. Um, one of the uh, points that we've touched on already in this presentation is that the Barima Mora Passage is part of the largest mangrove ecosystem remaining in Guyana, and that is a real global asset. Uh, mangroves around the world are critically endangered by a variety of pressures, including climate change, coastal development, um, everything from the development of, sh of shrimp farms to just uh, industrial pollution and in cutting for firewood. So. Um, this is a really special place. It's a really, uh, uh, we have a great opportunity here to, uh, to really uh, elevate its visibility on the world stage and uh, create this uh, special protected area. Um, we surveyed birds in this area 
for a variety of reasons. One is that um, there was very little existing data on birds of this region. Um, the map in the center of the screen here shows, uh, it's, this is a map from eBird, and it's basically showing this, the accumulation. This is just from this year. It's showing the accumulation of species uh, at various places in Guyana. And what it really does is it shows, with the exception of this one outlier out in Region 7, um, it shows really where most of the birding in Guyana happens and where most of the bird data um, that we have available to us is from. Um, and that is basically the area around Georgetown and the immediate coastline around Georgetown, and then down along the trail through Yorkrama and then down into the Rupununi. Um, that is where most bird tour itineraries focus, and that is where a lot of uh, data that comes into eBird from Guyana uh, is, is really focused. Areas like the New River Triangle, the highlands of Region 7, and in Region 1, uh, they don't get very much uh, coverage by birders, and there haven't been too many scientific surveys of birds there either. Um, birds are important for the ecosystem in general. Um, I don't think I really need to tell you much about this. They provide ecosystem services, including seed dispersal. Uh, they're important for pest control. They are a important source of food in a lot of communities and also income. Um, some pe you know, people do derive income from trapping. Um, and there is also, from a tourism, from an economic perspective, they're also uh, important because they're the main reason that a lot of tourists, eco-tourists come to Guyana. Um, you know, there are, I can't even name how many bird tour companies are operating in Guyana now, but it's a lot. And um, these guys come and they uh, spend quite a bit of money to get to places to see a lot of birds that are rather difficult to see in other parts of their ranges. Um, and the other real reason that we surveyed birds is just because there's not a lot of data. So um, we don't know much about the birds here. Most of the data in this region comes from Shell Beach. There are some, there were some surveys in Shell Beach up, you know, at various points in the last 20 years. The only survey that I know of that uh, happened in the Burima Mora Passage itself was a survey by the Smithsonian and the University of Kansas in 2002. And that was fairly near the community of Morawana. And they collected specimens over about a two week period uh, at some, uh, along a creek that was uh, off the Burima River on the, on the uh, I guess the right side, so the northern side of the Burima River. Let's see here, my slides are not advancing for some reason. Let me try something here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the goal of this survey, uh, we had, we had really three main goals. The first was to detect, identify, and document as many bird species as we could find and build a preliminary baseline list of birds for the Burima Memorial Passage. The second was to establish transects for bird monitoring. This, the idea here was that we would establish these um, ideally one kilometer transects. that could be resurveyed uh, at you know, various times of the year and across years to generate data in a fairly standardized way to track uh, the the, not only numbers of birds seasonally, but also between years, and also just to continue to try to uh, accumulate bird species for the area. Uh, as Matt alluded to, uh, that proved a little challenging uh, based on the terrain. The third objective here was to train local rangers in bird identification and survey methods. So we uh, were really keen on capacity building uh, if tourism is going to be a viable industry here, you need to have strong local talent. And so our goal was to cultivate that. Okay, so our methodology uh, consisted mainly of what I would call just birding. Um, we, we spent a lot of time in the boat uh, surveying along rivers and creeks. Um, we maneuvered our boat into whatever creeks that we could get up. We were dependent on the tides to some degree. Um, if the tide was favorable, we could get fairly far into the forest off of the rivers. Uh, when we had the option to do so, we uh, got out of the boat and surveyed on foot, mainly around schoolyards and farms, but also in the communities of Smith Creek, Morawana, and in Batero themselves. Um, and the way we collected data um, to be as nimble and as flexible as possible was to use a technique called the McKinnon or 10 species list technique. And this is a technique where you um, essentially write down all the birds that you see, all the individual birds that you see uh, in the order that you see them. 
more or less. And then what you do after that is you take these, these lists of birds and you break up the list into, te into 10 species segments. Um, so this is done after you come out of the field each day. Um, using those 10 species lists, you can feed those into programs like Program Spadar, which is a shiny app that uh, allows you to generate diversity estimates based on this kind of data. Um, all of our data were entered in the eBird as well. So we have georeference points uh, where we conducted all of our survey work. And so all of that information is uh, viewable on eBird. Um, if you go into eBird and look at region one, you can see where we went birding and you can see what we saw and where. So here are our results. Um, you can see on the bottom right there, a map of the Burima Mora Passage. And above that is a, a series of points showing where we did our, our surveys. So each one of those blue dots is a eBird locality that we surveyed. So we covered the area quite well. Uh, we covered it pretty thoroughly. You can see a clustering of points around Morawana and Smith Creek up in the top of the screen. Um, that's because we spent quite a bit of time in those areas. Uh, you also see a couple points around Marble Room itself. Uh, the data from those points were not included in our analyses because Mabaruma proper is not within the boundaries of the SPA. So um, moving on here. Um, the, so here's what our results were. We had about, we had 187 species that we observed during the time that we were there. And then uh, looking through historical data, uh, I picked up 57 additional species. Most of those were from the Smithsonian and University of Kansas expedition in 2002. Uh, so that brings the total of species known to occur in the, in the Bremen Moore Passage up to 244. Um, our 10 species list data, we had 178 10 species lists. Those contain se over 7,000 individuals of 180 species. And feeding that into the diversity estimator, um, it generated a variety of estimators. The most, uh, the highest one was the Chow 2 estimator. Um, and so the official predicted number that I'm putting out here is 256 species. Um, that was the highest, highest, highest confidence interval that we could get. Um, a lot of the estimators actually predicted lower diversity than we observed uh, if, you, if you factor in those 57 additional species. So uh, they somewhat underperformed. Um, I think a lot of the reason for that was because we spent a lot of our time in uh, you know, uh, you know, early successional habitats is what we would call them. So uh, areas around schools and villages where there's a lot of ecological generalists and the avifauna doesn't really vary from one place to another. Um, in other words, we did not spend a lot of time in taller forest away from the rivers where we were likely to pick up a lot more species. And that was mainly because of the, um, the difficulty of getting through the forest and also the tides uh, inhibiting us from getting up too far up some of the creeks that ran off of the main rivers. Uh, the most abundant species by far was orange-winged parrot, um, a really truly uh, impressive number of orange-winged parrots in this area. Uh, we had 2, 000, over 2,000 individual orange winged parrots on our 10 species list. That's over a quarter of all birds that we counted uh, were orange winged parrots. Um, and that species, along with crested oropendula and scarlet ibis, accounted for about 50% of all birds that we saw. So there are a few species there that are uh, especially abundant, and they, are, uh, they were really uh, spectacular to see. The most widespread species was the humble banana quit. Uh, this is a you know small bird. It's uh, with a striped head, yellow below. They're common all over Guyana. They're common in Georgetown and just about any settlement. 45% um, of our 10 species list have banana quit on them. So there really are a, a truly impressive number of banana quits in this area. Um, the highlights of our survey were these two species, uh, first and foremost. These are new records for Guyana. The first one on the left here is the belted kingfisher. Uh, this was reported for Guyana previously. Uh, belted kingfisher is a species that breeds in North America during the non-breeding season, so roughly from October to April. Um, they winter, they, they disperse down through the southern U.S. and then out across the Gulf of Mexico and along the coast of Central America and really throughout the Caribbean basin. Um, they're fairly regular on Trinidad, but they don't seem to get into continental South America very much uh, beyond, you know, beyond the Orinoco Delta, basically. Um, there are only a couple of records for the Guianas. I don't even know if there are any confirmed records for either Suriname or French Guiana. Uh, we encounter belted kingfisher on the first day out from Mabaruma. Uh, we, can, we encounter one right at the junction of the, or the confluence of the Barima and Aruka rivers. Um, there it was. 
And we ended up seeing two or three more of them over the course of the time we were there. Leon got this excellent photo. And uh, so we can now uh, confidently say that belted kingfishers do occur in Guyana, at least in region one. Um, and the really exciting species that we got in addition to that was uh, the guy on the right. This is the black chested tyrant. Um, this is a really mysterious bird that uh, I had, was hoping we would find. Uh, about 15 years ago, I did some field work in the Orinoco Delta and I saw black chested tyrant there. And so I surmised that there might be black chested tyrants in this region because we're quite close to the Orinoco Delta here. And uh, on our first morning out when we actually had good weather, uh, I heard one and we ended up tracking it down and calling it in. Uh, we ended up seeing a several more of them during the time that we were there. Uh, this is a really sort of enigmatic bird. It's, um, it's very spottily distributed and it's highly, highly sought after by bird watchers. This is a bird that you can never really count on seeing uh, anywhere you go. In Suriname, there's only one record. It was from 40 years ago. Uh, it has not been seen since. There's never been one seen in French Guiana. So, and the other, the remaining localities for this species are scattered around Eastern Brazil. So it's a real, uh, it's really special to find them in the Brimamora Passage. And not only that, they seem to be fairly common there. So if, you know, a birder is coming to Guyana and looking for black chested tyrant, um, this would probably be a pretty good place to go because it's a pretty sure bet that you'll see them there. Um, so that was really exciting, um, even more so that the Smithsonian team did not find black chested tyrant when they were there uh, 20 years ago. Um, so uh, pretty nice to find these, and it's great to know that uh, you can continue visiting a place like this and continue to find uh, new species. And I will say, um, I'll say now that I think that if there were additional surveys in this area, there are several other species of birds that are found in the Orinoco Delta that have not been recorded in Guyana, and I think there's a good chance that they could be recorded in Guyana with a little extra survey effort. Okay. A few other uh, special birds we saw so, are some uncommon species, species that um, we found here that are not uh, often seen elsewhere in Guyana. Um, one of them on the left here is a swallow tanager that we saw a group of them uh, in Morawana. Um, a neat little bird, um, but kind of hard to find in Guyana. Um, it's, it's got a wide range uh, over the Amazon basin and elsewhere in South America, but it is just not something, you know, I've been birding in Guyana for a long time and you just don't see swallow tanagers in many places. So it was neat to see those. Uh, and then the guy on the right is velvet front of grackle. This is a fairly common bird in region one, but it's only in region one. Um, this bird is, uh, is not found elsewhere in Guyana. So if you're coming to Guyana as a bird watcher, you will need to go to region one if you wanna see this species. Um, so uh, we found them to be quite common uh, and that's one of the special birds of this area. Okay, so the take home message here is that uh, the Brimo Mora Passage harbors a diverse bird community. It's probably well in excess of 256 species. Um, if you um, go to, you know, some of the more traditional forested areas, you could find 400 to 500 species. So we think that it's highly likely that there's at least 100 more species than we found, and probably even more than that. And the reason for that, as Matt alluded to, is that uh, the Brimamore Passage seems to be a transition zone between a mangrove ecosystem and these interior forest ecosystems. And so it has species of birds that are typical of both ecosystems. Um, that is, um, uh, that's a recipe for, for really high diversity and uh, a really uh, rich avifauna. Um, as I mentioned before, we think our survey data might be biased in favor of widespread generalists. So. Uh, we do recommend conducting another survey in the dry season when we can get into slightly uh, drier forest that's away from the mangrove areas uh, to really drive up the species list. Um, a lot of the species that were found by the Smithsonian group in 2002 were these forest species that are, that are quite common elsewhere in Guyana, but they're more uh, rainforest, what I would call rainforest species that um, do not tend to occur in a mangrove ecosystem. Um, the weather was terrible during our trip, and this, this is a, a, a position we were frequently forced to adopt, ducking under the leatherette to try to ward off the rain. We spent a lot of time hunkered down from the rain. Uh, we spent a lot of time in Morawana under, uh, on, the, on the ferry landing, uh, waiting for the rain to pass. 
we ended up losing uh, from anywhere from a couple of hours to almost an entire day uh, terrain during the survey, which considering that we were surveying on, in October was, was unusual. We were expecting it to be much drier. Um, so another reason that we may have underestimated diversity on our survey was just because we had really bad weather and that's something we can't control. Another reason for a dry season survey. A um, few highlights of the avifauna here. Um, highly abundant or highly visible and abundant uh, avifauna in the Brumamora Passage. This, and I'm going to talk for the rest of the time here, mainly about the potential for tourism, because I think that this is uh, really the, the, uh, the key thing here is to note that with when you have this abundance of birds, um, Abundance of birds is one thing, but if you can't see them, then the area becomes less desirable to tourists. And in this case, in the Brumamora Passage, you have a lot of birds that are very easy to see. Um, and that's great, especially because not everybody is a hardcore bird watcher. A lot of people enjoy seeing birds, but it's not as enjoyable if you can't really see the birds. And in this case, we have a lot of really easy to see birds uh, and some of them present in large numbers. We have high diversity from the different forest types high abundance of things like parrots or pendulas, scarlet ibises, herons and birds of prey, big things, easy to photograph, easy to see. And then we have this special bird here, the crimson hood mannequin. Um, this is just an illustration of a, a species that is not really found along Guyana's main birding and tourism circuit, at least not in the numbers that you would find them in region one. Um, this is a swamp forest species. It's really not found in the interior. Uh, it has a really, uh, spectacular plumage. The males have a spectacular plumage. It has a really interesting display. And near the village of Smith Creek, we were able to watch these birds displaying. And that's where Leon got this photo. Um, really, really uh, nice bird to find. And just an example of some of the things that you could see in region one that you might not be able to see elsewhere. So the next steps as far as the birds go is to continue local capacity building and tourism development. Um, we think that there's a lot of potential for uh, bird tourism development here, um, and also uh, the opportunities to train local guides to help take people to where the birds are. Um, we do think more bird surveys could yield additional new species for Guyana. Um, I can think of at least two off the top of my head that I'm fairly sure occur in that area um, that we just didn't happen to see when we were there. Um, and the other thing we would like to do is promote more use of the apps uh, these are Cornell Lab apps, uh, eBird and Merlin, to broaden access to data and resources. These are apps that you can load on your phone. Um, Merlin is an ID aid, and eBird is a way to record data and, um, and build a database, an online database of bird species in the region, which in turn can really, um, because these apps are, because eBird in particular is used by visiting bird watchers to kind of plan their itineraries, um, it's really, uh, beneficial to put bird data into eBird just to showcase the bird diversity of this area. Um, we had some unanticipated issues with offline functionality of those apps when we were in the field. Um, I've heard from Cornell that they're working to resolve them, so hopefully we can get that resolved soon and we can do some more trainings in the future uh, with, those, with those resources. And that is all I have, so I would be happy to take any questions uh, about that. <clears throat> All right, thank you, um, Dr. O'Shea. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. All right, so I just want to say that uh, when looking back at um, Brian's photo when everybody was in the rain, so I was with Mark on our fishery studies and we had like two or three days of rain out there, but we tried to, to do as much as we can during that study. And, you know, whether rain or sun, we still work. <laughs> it was all part of the experience. So coming back to again, um, no matter what career that we have, you know, research unlocks the unknown. It lets you explore the world from different perspectives and it fuels a deeper understanding in some of the areas. You know, research helps you to, you know, it's part of our success. It expands your knowledge. It gives you, you know, more information. It builds your credibility. It gives you the curiosity. For example, like the Burima Mora Passage, right? Um, we we did not know about it. All we thought is, hey, it's a dense forest. What's happening there? So we had these three 
um, incredible researchers that went out there with it, their team and they pre uh, presented or they found, uh, you know, some incredible findings. You know, they provided a wealth of knowledge on the presence of biodiversity in the Brimamore Passage Special Protected Area. And um, it indicated keystone species, uh, several giants in Guyana, the discovery of new species and uh, species that are I, uh, ICUN red listed. You know, the Barimamora Passage uh, Special Protected Area is a unique habitat for multiple species of you know, freshwater and estuarine fishes that Mark would have said. Uh, this area would support many commercial species that are, you know, vulnerable, making it important for the livelihood of the, of, for the locals in that community. And as Mark would have stated, that there's an urgent need for legal protection of this area to preserve their existing mangrove, biodiversity, and ecosystem services while maintaining the, li the livelihood of the local. But nevertheless, I know that our participants are very eager to, um, so that they have some questions here that uh, we can start discussing. And if you have any questions, you feel free to raise your hands and we'll unmute you. We have our facilitator, Nathan and um, Nathan, Siren and Tajani will also assist in this. All right. So we have a question here from Ariana Harris to Mark and Matt. In terms of tourism, in a similar way to the birds, do you guys think there is a potential for tourism-related activity in the Barima Mora Passage? For example, large mammal spotting tours or sport fishing? So Mark and Matt, over to you. Mark, you want to talk about sport fishing first? Sure, I, I'll go first. Yes, Ariane. Uh, definitely, there is potential for sports fishing. Um, I was actually amazed at the size of the fishes that I've seen in, in this study because I've seen similar fishes along the coast of Guyana, but the, the, I had never seen such large fishes. And we find that most of the time, the persons who do the sports fishing, actually, they, are, they go after the larger fishes. Um, and this would be very good, but also we have to at the same time, we'd also have to be very careful, um, especially not, not to put any more pressure on species on some species such as the Atlantic tarpon that I mentioned, or Rokofum, which is already one rebel. And this is one of the large size fish that persons might may, may also want to go after. But apart apart from that, yes, there is great potential for uh, sports fishing as well as. Um, fish aside, the other biodiversity that's found in this area, and even the pristine ecosystem and the mangroves in this in this particular region, which is quite unique in comparison to the others found in region two to six. Sure, and and uh, related to mammals, Ariane, thanks for your question. Um, so. Mammals are always, the large mammals are always the, the hardest species to see, no matter uh, which part of South America you're in, Rupununi, Barima Mora, uh, Ecuador, Peru, anywhere, everybody wants to see jaguars and um, they don't like to make themselves seen. So uh, that is always a challenge in South America um, is seeing those, especially the cats, um, because they are very secretive and, um, you know, they, they tend to avoid places uh, where humans are frequenting. That said, I think that um, the Bremamore Passage is uniquely suited for a few species that are of interest to tourists. So I, I mentioned that we saw giant river otters while we were there. Those are always a favorite of tourists. And, and some people go to the Rupununi, for example, just to see a giant river otter. So um, I think there is potential for river-based tourism in the Brima Mora Passage. Um, I didn't mention that we did see West Indian manatees um, while we were there. Certainly a species that, um, that tourists are interested in seeing and uh, Annette and uh, Miss Odesi from PAC were kind enough to coordinate a visit to Shell Beach. Um, Fernando and I had never been there. So we went out to Shell Beach for a day and we did see Guyanan dolphins on our way out. Um, and that, of course, the marine mammals are always 
a favorite among tourists and one that um, people would like to see. We did see um, capuchins, squirrel monkeys, and howler monkeys during the surveys from the boats. And so I think that, you know, those species um, are also, you know, so definitely of interest as to your kind of general wildlife tourists. I know that you're serious birders uh, that would be going and targeting some of the species that Brian was mentioning and that uh, Leon might carry on his tourists. They may see a mammal and just want it to get out of the way because it's blocking a bird. Um, but there's certainly uh, a number of species that I think would be of interest to tourists who are doing sort of general wildlife riverine tours um, and you would get a chance to see a number of the large mammals. All right, thank you, Matt and Mark. I hope that answers Ariane's question. Annette, I see you, ha you have your hand raised. You can unmute. Actually, I had my question in the um, box, but thanks, Maria. First of all, I just want to say thank you to the three guys for uh, three phenomenal presentations. You really re-energize re me in terms of the way forward. And my question was to Brian, how soon can we get you back to do the dry season survey? Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anytime, anytime. Um, I'd love to come back. Um, obviously it's getting into rainy season now. Um, I was really surprised that um, it was so wet in October. Um, and that was really a kind of, uh, it really, I think, put a damper on things. But um, if we could get to get there in a time when the water was, it was just a little bit easier to move around uh, over land, uh, that would be really great. So um, yeah, we, we can talk about it. All right, great, thank you. Um, Annette, you have a next question there? No, yeah. I, was actually, I was actually trying to answer Brian, but um, <laughs> somebody muted me. Um, yeah, Brian, uh, definitely can we, um, plan for that because I really feel that um, indeed the amount of time you lost because of the horrendous rain, um, we need to make back, make back up. So I would want to say that let's go ahead and start planning for that dry season survey um, as soon as you're available. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. For Thank you. Um, so there's a question for Brian and Matt. Um, can sustainable harvest level be calculated for species that are targeted for trade? So Brian or Matt, you can answer that. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I was looking for it in the chat, I didn't see it. <laughs> it came directly. Oh, okay. um, so the question is, can sustainable harvest level be calculated for species that are targeted for trade? Yeah, <laughs> a difficult question. <laughs> yeah. um, I was letting Brian jump in. I, I don't want to say yes, uh, <laughs> and I don't want to say no. <laughs> um, you know, I think you need to be very careful with it. Um, I, I, you know, I think that like a lot of things, you know, that people set hunting quotas here for animals in the United States. Um, if everybody were to harvest that many animals, there wouldn't be any left. But um, you know. I, at the same time, I'm concerned sometimes when I see some of the harvest quotas that have been set for parrots, for instance, uh, for Guyana, um, that's a lot of birds. And these are long lived birds that don't have very high uh, reproductive rates. And so I think you'd have to look at it on a species by species basis. And I think you'd have to um, constantly be assessing and refining your uh, harvest estimates like they do in the US for a lot of game animals. Uh, but also more, most importantly, you need to enforce these these any regulations that you have with wildlife uh, harvesting. Um, I think those are the real issues you have to address um, beyond just setting a quota. Okay, great. Um, Matt, well, I think for the, oh, sorry, but as far as the mammal goes, mammals go, um, I think uh, just sort of partially echoing what Brian says, um, in places where they do have um, you know, fairly well managed populations of large mammals, uh, like deer in the United States, for instance. Um, typically, those are accompanied by uh, 100 year old data sets that um, contain, you know, sometimes millions of data points. Um, and so there's a high level of reporting by hunters, and you can track harvest levels. 
um, by age class and sex and across years and correlated with weather patterns and all sorts of things that um, allows you to sort of over time refine your harvest quotas. Um, actually, in the US, white-tailed deer, for example, were nearly hunted to extinction in the early 1900s. And so the harvest quotas that were later set were a reaction to mistakes that were made at the beginning. And so, you know, sort of wildlife managers keep going, oh, set it at this, oh, that was too much. We can monitor next year, oh, let's lower it a little bit. Okay, that was good and we're raising and you're sort of adjusting over time. One of the challenges with tropical mammals is that uh, it's really only now that we're starting to get an idea of what uh, the impact of varying levels of harvest are. And the reason for that is because um, tropical mammals walk around in the rainforest where it's very hard to see them uh, and in very rugged terrain. White-tailed deer walk around in the open eating grass and it's very easy to, all you need is a Jeep and some binoculars to see them. With bush deer, you might get lucky and see one a year. Um, and so it, they're very hard to monitor, but tools like camera traps are allowing us to uh, take a peek into the lives of these secretive tropical forest mammals when we don't have to be physically present. And so the, the studies that are going on across South America are starting to give us an idea of what are the impacts of varying levels of harvest. Um, but I think that having really specific uh, levels, we could say you can take 100 uh, bush deer and that'll be sustainable forever is we're not quite there yet. And it'll probably take us a little while to sort of get there. Great, I hope that answers the question. There's a next question for you, Matt. You mentioned the presence of the West Indians manatee. Is there any estimate on the population around the Brema Moor Passage? No, um, not at all. I, I only, I, I had heard from other people, um, Wally Prince, who had done some previous work for Protected Areas Commission in Shell Beach, Annette, uh, Miss Annette had seen manatees around the area before. Uh, and then in talking, we uh, Brian talked about Smokey um, and he was our guide as well. And he sort of knew the whole place back to front. And he told us that manatees were around. Um, we saw one. Um, so I, I know that there's at least one in Brema Mora Passage, but I wouldn't, I haven't ever heard of a study of manatees going on in the area or even much study of manatees in Guyana other than the ones that are in the national park. Um, people study those every weekend. Um, but I think that it's certainly an area of interest. I, I work and live in Florida and uh, there are hundreds of people that are studying the, the manatee population that's here. Uh, and we're at the very Northern extent of their range. And so in the core of the of the range of West Indian manatees, it would be great to see, um, you know, some students doing some work on them. And I'm hoping that a student who's working with me here uh, might be working with GMCS in the future to do some work on manatees as well. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. There hasn't been much work done to my knowledge in the past. All right, great. Thank you. We have another question here in the chat from Mahendra said, well, he's congratulating you guys on the presentation. This, go, this presentation goes to Mark or anyone else. Can you comment on the carbon sequestration potential of the mangrove in the Brema Mora Passage? Do you have any sense of how much carbon is stored there versus other forest type in Guyana? And, what, and what's the economic value of this might be? So Thanks the question me. goes to Mark. Uh, you want me to read it, read it back again for you? I'm seeing it in the chat as well. Okay. Yes. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are no estimates of the uh, carbon from the, the this specific region uh, of Guyana. But I do know that there are other estimates from the other coastal regions where the mostly black mangroves exist. Um, Recent estimates actually showed that some of our um, restored mangrove areas uh, where the black mangroves have been planted in monocultures have actually have higher levels of biomass in comparison to natural mangroves versus uh, other uh, ecosystems. Um, but that's a really good question because the composition of mangroves in region one is completely different from the other regions. Um, having more red mangroves 
having those trees that having a higher uh, with higher bulb density um, definitely suspect that there will be higher levels of, of um, biomass in these in this particular area and this in these species in comparison to the others. So there's definitely scope for research um, to estimate the potential carbon potential of these mangroves in the region. All right, thanks, Mark. All right, so I this is a question to Matt, Brian, and Mark. So during your studies along the Brimamora Passage, and well, Mark would have mentioned it, um, you know, what was the most dominant mangrove species along that area? Are you talking about what species of mangrove? Yeah. Uh, red? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 my understanding was that the white mangrove is, is further out toward the toward the coast and that most of the mangroves along the Burima River at least in the Ruka River down from um, down from uh, Mabaruma is mostly red mangrove um, but I, I, I've, I've you know I've been struggling with this for years I just I can identify birds but when I look at these trees I, I can't tell one mangrove from the other so um, <laughs> It, it, I know that a lot of people can do it very quickly, but I, I just, for, I've always struggled with the two. Okay. So I don't really know. All right, thanks. Uh, I see Annette has her hand up. So Annette. Um, just to add to the, the earlier question about the mangroves, Mark, um, remember Stephen Monsami had done an economic evaluation um, assessment of the Brima Mora Passage mangroves in... Um, 2020 when you guys went out with um Joe Ryan. So we could we could probably um you know share that report with the, the, the person who asked uh, the question. But just to add as well that apart from the mangroves itself, the, this area has a lot of wetlands and peatlands. Mm -hmm. And those wetlands and peatlands store even more carbon than even the mangroves. So in, 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 in essence, this Brim Memorial Passage with the Shelbyshire Protected Area is one of the largest blue carbon sinks nationally. And that's a very important point um, to just basically share. Um, also, also um, Mark, the, the, the red mangroves, as you said, are, are, are more abundant in the area, I guess, because the area is, is more riverine than, than coastal. So I would think that um, the majority of the, the black mangroves are found along the coastline, whereas the, the riverine areas are mainly red as well. And some of the biggest mangrove trees that I've ever seen in my life. I, we have um, a, a fair number of mangroves here in Florida where I live now. Um, but almost all of them are in tiny patches in between massive developments, coastal developments in Florida. And most of the trees um, are still fairly immature and have been planted from restoration. And so one of the things that really struck me about the Brima Mora Passage was just the one that the mangroves went as you were driving down the river. It was just sheer mangroves. They were going on and on and on and on and on as you were driving. And then uh, also the, the height of the trees, that there were immense mangroves that must be very, very old. And so I think it's one of those things that um, there are probably few places left in the world, sadly, where you could see uh, an intact mangrove habitat like this that has lots of very large trees. Um, and so another reason that sort of warrants this special protected area status. Yes, Matt, and also Tom Hollowell, the late Tom Hollowell had done a lot of study in the mangroves in the Waini Peninsula as well. After the El Nino fires of um, 1998, a huge swath had burnt out. And uh, he had some photographs of some of those black mangroves where the girth of that tree was um, several feet, almost like three to four feet wide. It was astonishing how, how big they can actually get once they are left undisturbed, you know? That is another. That is another very um, exciting area of study for future researchers as well. Okay. 
Indeed, indeed. Potential research coming up soon. <laughs> All right. Um, can we have two more questions? Um, if you don't want to type, feel free to unmute and you can ask your questions. All right, I see there is no more questions coming in. So I'll kindly ask you guys to um, turn on your videos so we can do a little uh, picture moment. And Sarah, she will do this um, screenshots of that. So we'll do one with a serious face and the other with a funny face, all right? You can use your reaction to, you know, to make it look fun, maybe a smiley face, a laughy face, something to sort. <laughs> All right, Sarah, whenever you're ready, let me know. Three, two, one, stay mangrove. Got it. All right, let's let's do another one just just in case. <laughs> Got it. All right, you got it. So now let's do a funny one. You can do maybe some hand fingers or use the little reaction. Uh, let us know when you're ready. One, ready. two, three. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, great. So, all right. Um, I don't see any more questions. All right. So thank you so much to all the researchers uh, to pre, uh, present in their finding of the Barima Mora passage. And I would like to also extend uh, gratitude for all the participants for listening this evening. Thank you so much. Um, and this brings us to the end of our webinar for today. Good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Maria and Sarah, Nathan, everyone else who helped. Yes, Appreciate thank it. you all. Great job, yeah. guys. Um, great, great presentation. It was very interesting to, uh, to be learning a lot from the mammal st uh, studies and the, the birds as well, too. I've never done a bird studies before, but um, it was you know, very interesting to, to, to see those discoveries that you have there. Yeah. And um, on behalf of GMCS, we look forward to, you know, working with you guys and um, looking forward for more research from you all, too. Yeah, that was my first time in Region 1 also, and uh, it was great. So I'd love to come back. Yeah, the same, same here. Well, now that we have the, um, the Matera Research Station, I guess, instead of staying at Broom's Hotel now, we can stay, stay over there. <laughs> so yeah, yeah a, a different experience. I was going to say that the research station looks really nice. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. coming along. Yeah. I think we do have one uh, research up there presently um, that is doing his um, PhD. Uh, his name is Bob. Um, he's looking at the the canoes, the history of making canoes and stuff like that. And I, it's, it's very interesting because, um, you know, it's something new and we've never done any of that study here in Guyana. So we look forward for his finding at the end of the three, four months that he has here in Guyana. Very cool. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, um, I guess we'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye. Sounds good. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye.